Today's show is brought to you by the Pittsburgh Opera. The Pittsburgh Opera is presenting an adulterous double feature not seen here since 1996. It's got jealousy, two-timing, and revenge all united in the back-to-back tragedies of Cavalleria Rusticana and Pagliacci. Possessiveness, machismo, and rage fuel their bloody conclusions. And you can enjoy these two amazing operas on the same night, November 9th, through the 17th. That's with the Pittsburgh Opera, who asks, where can we take you? Learn more at pittsburghopera.org slash citycast. Today on CityCast Pittsburgh, on Election Day, we saw a huge red wave, both nationally and here in Pennsylvania. And like always, the majority of Allegheny County voted Democrat. It's got a lot of progressives pretty shaken up, but also ready to move forward. Today, we're taking a beat and talking about what comes next for people here in the city and throughout the state now that conservatives have so thoroughly consolidated their power. It's November 8th, the Friday News Roundup. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. I am so excited to be joined on mic today by Miracle Jones, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at One Hood Media. Miracle, thank you so much for making space for this today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored. And we're with also Natalie Bensavanga, a socially conscious journalist uh, and CityCast contributor. Welcome back, Natalie. I'm so happy to be with both of you. I feel like most of us have been kind of marinating in this new reality for a little while now. Trump has won the White House. Republicans took the U.S. Senate. And they also won a bunch of really important statewide races, including attorney general and more. It really was this solid, deep red wave. What does that signal to each of you when you kind of step back and take that all in? Yeah, I'll start. I think it signals the amount of money and influence that's in our politics, because I don't think you can talk about the attorney general race without talking about Jeff Yass, a local billionaire who literally bankrolled a race and bought a politician and dumped so much money uh, into the elections. I don't think you can talk about Elon Musk um, buying a social media app and pushing not only conservative ads, conservative talking points, uh, having a PAC that was heavily involved within Pennsylvania, that was sending people mailers in Pennsylvania. There was literally a billionaire takeover of Pennsylvania to push a lot of far right talking points while at the same time to actively suppress the vote because of the fact that there have been some Democrat leaders who have literally abandoned queer people trans kids, uh, working class folks. And we just really saw that intersect with this past election. Yeah. And to dovetail off of that, I agree with everything Miracle said. But the reality is the messaging of the Dems has been off for a while. And to Miracle's point, you know, we both work in media. We both understand the importance of messaging. We understand the importance of misinformation and disinformation that spreads like wildfire on social media, especially when you have groups of people who feel disillusioned and left behind. And the Democrats have really got to do some soul searching here and think about who are they trying to attract with their messaging? Is that the base on which this party was founded on? And I think a lot of that has gotten lost lost in the shuffle, trying to go after people that are never going to vote for them. And I think there needs to be some time lost in the woods to recalibrate and understand that we don't have a party in this country that works for people. Maybe these kinds of losses will be that wake up call to recognize that we need to get back to working class values on the left. You can tell y'all are both like in spaces where, you know, you feel your feels, but then you get right back to work. Um, I mean, how are you imagining that Pittsburghers here at home are likely to be affected by a Trump presidency? We'll start at the top. I think the biggest thing is going to be reproductive justice, right? Uh, Pennsylvania was a safe haven 
for abortion access to the point that our surrounding neighbors were coming to Pennsylvania to seek abortion care. The threat of a national abortion ban is going to be huge, particularly for, you know, the Black population. You know, Black women are three times more likely to die of maternal mortality within Pennsylvania, um, higher than the national average, right? Um, our infant mortality rates are higher. We need abortion because it is health care for people who are fighting illnesses, right? We have so many Black people who are also fighting cancer, who are fighting diseases because of environmental racism that's permeated throughout southwestern Pennsylvania. And so when you're pregnant and you're faced with a cancer diagnosis, when you're pregnant um, and you're faced with the fact that your body cannot physically carry the, this being to term and you're denied the access to an abortion or you're someone who has realized that you're not mentally able to carry through an abortion. That is going to be huge for so many people. In addition, um, if people are going to get prosecuted, what does that mean for our medical care workers, our medical facilities? You know, um, since the fall of Roe, it has been Black women who've been arrested for seeking um, health care and Black women who've been arrested for having miscarriages because people don't even understand what an abortion is. And so Black women have literally been arrested and prosecuted simply for having a miscarriage. And so that is going to be a top of the line issue. But also a lot of our rights, I think sometimes we get into this idea that because we are, you know, a blueberry uh, in a red wave that um, mm -hmm. the city and the city council and county council enshrining our rights, there's nothing they can do with um, an, a ban if the federal government puts in a ban, if our Pennsylvania legislature pushes a ban. Um, and so that's going to be something that is really going to have an immediate impact on all of our industries, on the, the ability for women to seek their own care, the ability of women to work, the ability of women to travel. It's going to have an immediate detrimental impact on Pittsburgh. And kind of talking about some of those safe haven rules, you know, I, we are technically still safe, uh, but I think, you know, you're speaking a lot to the threats uh, here in Pennsylvania. Abortion is legal up to 24 weeks. Um, we can get medical care if something happens beyond that. It's very, very rare, which, Natalie, I know you've talked a lot about, too. But, you know, new numbers out just as we're recording look like our state legislature, both the state House and the state Senate are going to be Republican led too. Correct. Um, and we have a new attorney general who said, I am not going to push for anything, but I will follow the letter of the law. Right. I also um, want to add, I sit on the board of Planned Parenthood of Western Pennsylvania, and I was in an incredibly sobering meeting yesterday and listening to what is going to now happen because of a Trump administration, all of the things that Miracle had said, all of the things, Megan, mm -hmm. that you're saying, but they're going to come for uh, reproductive rights in a way that I don't think we're prepared for, including uh, mifepristone, which is, of course, the abortion pill, which will absolutely impact abortion care here in Pennsylvania. They're going to go after Title X funding, which is going to impact uh, abortion care here in Pennsylvania, as long as other forms of care um, at these spaces. On top of all of these reproductive rights issues and the issues around environmental justice that Miracle was speaking to. I also want to talk about the minimum wage. It's still $7.25 here in the state of Pennsylvania. And under the Trump administration, there is no way in hell anything will move um, the needle there, especially now that the, the state legislature is shifting and changing. And we really need to think about who is impacted by a starvation wage and the communities that are impacted and the communities that we need to continue to fight with and for. And you couple that with the inability to get reproductive health care when you need to, the inability to not be able to plan a family when you need to, you are basically all but guaranteeing the next generation be raised in poverty and basically forced to labor. And I think that's where this country really needs to take an assessment is this uh, god of capitalism that we've created and how all of these things have to happen in order for that god to be worshipped. We have not been able to push a minimum wage bill, right? Because it, it was how much should minimum wage be because we have despised and looked down on minimum wage workers. And we have basically said, well, you should make enough, but not too much, right? And so when we're having these conversations, I think it's like very important that we understand that the conservatives have not been a working class 
working friendly party. What they have done was said you have low wages, you do not have health care that is treating your cancer, treating your asbestos, treating the diseases you got while working. And it is the fault of an immigrant that we don't you don't have that. It is a, the fault of a queer trans person um, that your community is in chaos and disorder. They have not provided solutions to the issues that are impacting working class people. They have provided a boogeyman and an instance where people can divert and put their rage, anger, and blame while not demanding more of a political party. Student loan forgiveness was something that people wanted and supported. Medicare for all was something that people uh, wanted and supported. A Green New Deal was something that people wanted and supported. And these were policies that we have literally have moved away from as a, a Democrat majority, a Democrat establishment. These populist economic policies that people were really wanting to see, we moved away from. And that is what we have to get back in doing. And I hate the fact that when we're talking about working class values, we forget that Black people are working class. Hispanic people are working class. Women are working class. Queer and trans disabled people are working class. And we somehow only define working class as a white Republican worker, which is in itself white supremacy. And so when we're talking about building a big tent party, we also have to be very clear that all of our lives, all of our lived experiences uh, should be included, should be valued, and, and should be catered to, and no one's vote uh, should be taken for granted. And I know, Natalie, you have one, something you wanted to say. <laughs> Natalie's been bouncing <laughs> from side to side that whole no, time. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not bouncing any other reason than I just love it when Miracle talks and I get excited and I can't sit still because I um, agree <laughs> with all of those sentiments so wholeheartedly. And this is why I think we have to go back to this idea of the Democratic Party needs to realign itself and become the working people's party. And it needs to look and be represented by exactly all of the people, to your point, Miracle. But I think what I'm worried about, because going back to messaging and media, is because I think the Democrats took the wrong lessons from 2016, and they're going to take the wrong lessons again from this loss in 2024, and they're going to apply another whitewashed, cisgender male face to the working class, thinking that that's going to be the safe road to get uh, votes back in the next election cycle and in the midterm cycle. And I, I fear that once again, they're going to miss the mark because they're not listening to the people um, that that are, are actually out there, boots on the ground. And I will say this too, um, because I worked closely with the comms team uh, at the Biden administration during this election, and I was able to see how communications worked from the inside. I didn't work for them. It was just they were offering a lot of different interview opportunities to me, that's what I mean. It was it was a partnership in that way for media. I realized how incredibly disorganized and in disarray the comms teams were. And I talked to the comms director about that. And he said specifically, this is how it is with every single state. There is no centralized form of communication. And the Harris comms team and the state comms teams were never on the same page. And I find that really interesting because when you look at the Republicans, they have hit home maybe one to three large messages for the past eight years. Trump had the ability to campaign, really, for the last four years, right? Um, and so when we look at the Democrats, what is the message? Because I agree, it should be Medicare for all, paid leave for all, living wage for all. Can we pick two things? That's it, just two things, and just hammer the hell out of it at the local, the state, and the <laughs> national level, and maybe we would get people to click in with what we're all about. Today's show is brought to you by the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council. We know how much Yans love finding out about new events here on our podcast and in our Hey Pittsburgh newsletter. But if you're looking for even more options, we cannot say enough about the weekly arts and culture events roundups from our friends at the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council. Their arts blog has local arts and culture recommendations for every single day of the week, no exaggeration, including exhibits, concerts, performances, films, literary events, and so much more, all happening right here in our region. 
If you've ever gotten FOMO from missing out on a gorgeous local art opening or an installation that all your friends are posting about, I am pretty sure the Arts Council had the scoop. Be like us and check them out at pittsburghartscouncil.org or follow them on Instagram at PGH Arts Council. Is your cold making it hard for you to get to sleep and leading to a bad morning? Switch to Mucinex Night Shift for fast, powerful, nighttime, multi-symptom cold and flu relief. Mucinex Night Shift fights your worst nighttime symptoms to help you get to sleep and wake up ready to go. Mucinex Night Shift. It's comeback season. News is directed. You know, Natalie, you just mentioned Medicare, paid leave, living wages. I feel like we've hit on so many issues that you're both concerned about right now. I guess I'm wondering if either of you are seeing any opportunity in all of this, like what we can do here at home and also maybe where y'all are pointing folks to right now when maybe they're mentally struggling just with how seismic all of this feels right now each other, right? So that's, that's, that, that is the thing. Like, it, it is us who's going to push it. But to Natalie's point, the miscommunication did not happen in a vacuum. It happened because people want to run for higher office and they want to be the messengers. And understanding that when you are running to be a public servant, it's not about you, it's about the communities you represent. But I do think that we have to look towards each other. Um, the Democrats, the Working Families Party, two organizations, political organizations that people can get involved in. But, you know, our unions, you know, SCIU, uh, PA United, these organizations that have really good ground games that are organizing and, and fighting for worker for workers. You know, we're talking about the Women and Girls Foundation. You know, both of us have been a part of that organization. They have been organizing for sick leave for all, paid leave for all, have been really organizing, you know, for women and girls within Pennsylvania. And we haven't really talked a, a lot about that, but again, the Muslim vote, the Palestinian vote, the Arab vote, people, I, I always uh, quote this, it was uh, playwright James O'Hara said, when people have been radically excluded, they have to be radically included to know that you are safe and you have created a space and place for them. And I do think in this, these next six months, two years, we really have to dig deep in bringing our communities together, letting them know that they are loved and valued within our community, that they're not being pushed out, that this place is a safe place for them and their ideas and their experiences matter. And on top of that, we have to bridge the divide within our communities, right? We can't give messaging to people who do not believe, see us as trusted messengers. We can't give messaging uh, to people who feel like we only come around during an election season. And one of the things I have said um, to the chagrin of many, because I get blacklisted a lot of times, is we have not passed LGBT protections within the past four years, right? We ha Since Governor Wolf left Pennsylvania, we have not codified any LGBT-specific legislation um, into law, right? And I think that a lot of times we, we have these questions of like, why do people not turn out? Why are pe if people know that like their rights are on the line, why are they not turning out? Because we leave them behind. And even here in Allegheny County, they're still counting votes, of course, but it is mm -hmm. very close. It looks like we're going to be just maybe a, sh a few votes shy of where they fell in 2020. Yeah. And, and a part of that was, and we, and let's be very clear, we have outperformed the rest of Pennsylvania and Allegheny yeah, County, yeah. Philly right? Philly and Pittsburgh always show up for Democrats. They are blue strongholds always. We just showed up, I think, less than I think people were projecting we would. One of the things I like to point out is every year Summer has performed and she has brought people uh, to the ticket, outperformed. A Talking about Sum U.S. House Representative Summer Lee. Summer Lee, right? And despite being outspent, so she not only had uh, her own opponent coming after her, she had the whole national, local, and statewide Republican apparatus coming after her and still overperformed. Why? She was the first race that got called on election night here locally. Mm -hmm. It was not a question. It was not even close. Summer won. It was the one piece of, mm -hmm. of news that we had for like three hours. Yeah. Because she has shown up, right? She has shown up when anyone has wanted to reach out to her, even for 
for people who do not appreciate her votes. She still shows up to community. She still engages. She still talks to people. She still tries to bring people together. I, we are not going to be a utopia. There are things that we cannot agree on. But when we are in this city together, we have to be able to work together. There are things that we can do to build together, and we just haven't done it. And that, I think that's why the communication that Natalie was talking about is so important. I know you said you wanted to add some more, Natalie. Yeah. Um, getting back to that idea, Megan, what you were saying is, you know, what can we do here? Along with all of the great yeah. organizations that Miracle listed, and I, I also love the Women and Girls Foundation. I work with them. I would also add to that the Black Women's uh Policy Center with Rochelle Jackson. That's an amazing spot. I also think we really need to be supporting local journalism. I have been sounding the alarm on this um, for many, many months, if not years, that local years, years, <laughs> I think I can years, years. thank you, um, <laughs> that local journalism is in a bad way. We have news deserts all over the state. Obviously, One Hood does a wonderful job of bringing our news to the region, as does CityCast, but I do think it's really important if we want to save this very fragile democracy that we have, a free press is a true pillar of that. And if we do not support local journalists and local journalism and um, recognize that the these are the entities that are um, holding politicians, businesses, corporations, accountable for the actions that they do, more and more corruption will be able to be, uh, you know, done in these spaces. And I think that's what's going to get us through is accurate, fair journalism. Prep for Thanksgiving at Whole Foods Market. Save now on no antibiotics ever frozen whole turkey. Just one forty nine a pound with Prime. Sales on Brie and select seafood appetizers help get things started. For sides, go with Wallet Happy Favorites from three sixty five by Whole Foods Market. And finish with decadent desserts from the bakery. Or get your whole spread catered. Just order early. Get Thanksgiving ready at Whole Foods Market. Terms apply. 18 years from tonight, Grant Gill will become a comedy legend when he totally kills it at his improv class's graduation performance. Knees will be slapped. Hilarity will ensue. That's why he's already keeping himself in shape and razor sharp today with wellness tips and tools from AARP to help make sure his health lives as long as he does. Because the younger you are, the more you need AARP. Learn more at aarp.org slash healthy living. As you guys step back and consider maybe what could come next, I'm wondering how you look at some of our local officials um, and what you're hoping to see from them. Because, Miracle, you touched on this idea, um, my word, not yours, but like of ambition uh, and how that is is framing how some of our uh, elected leaders move up through the ranks. Um, you know, I don't think it's lost on any of us that Governor Josh Shapiro was in contention for vice president. He's been talked about as a potential contender to lead the Democratic Party at some point in the future. I personally would not be shocked if he were tried to run in 2028. But that means that it could frame some portions of his governorship going forward. He's got two years left on his current term. So you have to run again between now and then. But like when you step back and think about this, like the Democrats are trying to figure out what's coming next. And the person, at least at the top in our state, may have his eyes up anyway. Like, what does that say to you? And what are you hoping to see out of the next, you know, few weeks and years? Pennsylvania going red is the perfect opportunity for him to get out and mobilize and energize his base so that in two years, um, he's not only reelected, but that he can have more um, supports and bring in uh, potentially more Democratic uh, House uh, seats and more Democratic Senate seats, right? But the reality is that as you seek higher office, what communities are you going to advocate for and what communities are going to do away with? Um, and that is going to be the biggest thing. Also, our city council, our county council, are they going to try to become more conservative um, to try to ride to ride this like Trump wave? Or are they going to dig in and fight for the people who feel afraid and fearful right now? Um, and so that is what it's going to be really important. We know there are conversations. Um, 
can you tell which way it's going to go? Like, do you have a projection at this point? Uh, we don't have a projection because the biggest <laughs> thing right now I is... Wish, right? we, uh, <laughs> I wish, right? I wish. But we were talking to Monica from Casa San Jose. Monica Ruiz, who's been on this show as well. Yeah. Um, and the biggest fear that we have right now are people going to start targeting immigrants or people who they think are immigrants, right? And so this, I so that's going to be the big thing of like, who is going to be targeted? Um, how is this going to fall into play? Because... You know, that is a federal issue and city and county, they can say, you know what, our police do not work with. And this is also I want to be very clear because people do not understand what a sanctuary city is. A sanctuary city just means that our police and county do not automatically turn over people to ICE custody, that Mm -hmm. they are not looking at people's immigration status. They make sure ICE does the job of ICE. Individual police officers can report people's uh, immigration status. Other folks can report people's immigration status. And within three days, ICE can take custody of an individual and put them into proceedings or places for deportation. And so this idea that because Pittsburgh is a sanctuary city, that it's safe for immigrants, people are undocumented, is factually incorrect. And I think a lot of people thought that because we were a sanctuary city, that meant that people were not being deported. And there are people who are in the ACJ who are being held there simply because they were um, subject to deportation. Allegheny County Jail. Um, Yes, in Allegheny County Jail. And so I do think that sometimes we, we feel that because our city and county is trying to protect us, that it it insulates us from the the federal legislation, and it does not. Um, And that's something that I think we really have to think about when we're talking about protecting our our vulnerable. And too, just uh, quickly, in case you missed the show too, um, producer Mallory Falk on this show talked to Monica in the past, Monica Ruiz, just about how like Casa San Jose is trying to fill in the gaps for things that the federal government previously were doing. Like, if you need to go to an immigration court hearing here, you don't go to the courthouse. You go to her office in the South Hills and you sit in this tiny little room that used to be in a government building. And it's not anymore because they didn't want to do it. And so now Monica and Casa San Jose have stepped in again to fill those gaps. But that's the kind of level of like groundwork that's having to happen for some of our local organizations to 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 wrap around services because our government isn't. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add here that um, immigrants are less likely to make, to commit crimes. They pay into Social Security, whether they're documented or not. They're, they're paying they pay into a Medicare. tremendous amount in taxes. Yes, they're paying. Yes, I was going to say that they are also paying a ton of money. Um, into taxes, which of course support social services that we all utilize. Um, But what really frustrates me about a state like Pennsylvania being so up in arms about immigration and this idea of the border, which was obviously, I wouldn't even call it a talking point on the right, it was a screaming point on the right, um, is the fact that we we are losing population here in Pennsylvania. Okay, we need people to come here and build lives and raise their kids and um, go to school and create neighborhoods and create jobs and create small businesses and work for local businesses and corporations. We need immigrants. And so this idea um, that you know Pennsylvania would, would somehow benefit from further uh, deportation or restriction of bringing people to our communities and welcoming them is so antithetical to the economic progress that Republicans talk about constantly, it's like, well, you're, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. And I just, I, I hope we all recognize the moment that we're in and tap into local organizing. Voting is just one tool in our toolbox. And I encourage everyone to, to vote in every single election, whether it's at the very local race in your own backyard with your county council, all the way to the presidency, but there is so much work that needs to be done. Pick one issue that impacts you, that you feel connected to. We all cannot do everything, but we can all do one thing that can support our local communities. And so I encourage everyone to do some of that soul searching. What is the thing? For me, in the last few years, it's been reproductive rights. It's been single payer healthcare. I've been involved with those movements since I was 17 years old. Um, And now, because I've done so much work on KDKA radio, and especially with East Palestine, I've gotten really into 
environmental rights and how they intersect with racial and economic justice. I think we really, it, it, it is a dialogue, not a monologue when we're talking about politics. And we cannot afford, none of us can afford to sit on the sidelines while other people make decisions on our behalf and more, more importantly, take away our rights because we did not get activated. Natalie, before we go, uh, remind folks how they can find you and where they can listen to that KDK show. <laughs> sure. You can find me. Unfortunately for you, you can find me everywhere because I'm in all kinds of spaces. <laughs> um, but you can we love it. We love it. <laughs> you can find me on TikTok, on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn at Natalie Bensavenga. You can check out my website, NatalieBensavenga.com. And of course, I'm on KDKA Radio Every Saturday from 2 to 5 p.m., you can check that out streaming at kdkradio.com or at 100.1 uh, FM and AM 1020 KDK. And I've had both of you, both of you wonderful people mm -hmm. as guests on the show. And I look forward to having more conversations that impact us all with both of you as well. So thanks again, Megan, for always making space for these conversations and the wonderful crew here at CityCast Pittsburgh. Of course. We're, we're very honored. Um, and Miracle, before we go, how can folks get plugged in with what you're doing with One Hood? Uh, yes. Again, thank you to CityCast. Thank you to you, Megan, uh, for One Hood, at One Hood on um, Twitter, at One Hood Media on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and for C4, people want to do electoral organizing work. It's at One Hood Power. Uh, those are the two uh, social media places you can go, at OneHood.org and at OneHoodPower.org. Uh, and I would just say, keep I know people is you know, people always stress out and get angry and, and scared. They're grieving this week. They're grieving, but there's work yes. to be done. There's work to be done, but it's always just a remind that our safety is in each other. Uh, we can't let our communities be divided. Uh, we can protect each other. We can support each other. We can learn from other movements. We can learn from what's, you know, the Chicano movement. We can learn from the indigenous rights movement. We can learn from the, you know, the, pro like, I love me a good French protest. I don't know if you ever, like, uh, you know, follow, like, international news, but, like, the, follow, look at the French. The French know how to protest, <laughs> right? There, there are silver linings, right? We know how to fight fascism. We know how to fight violence. Um, uh, and we and that is by showing up for each other, by understanding that we are all, we are all good neighbors. I don't know who's going to be our next Mister Rogers, but we need them. I'm you know I'm pushing on you, Natalie. Oh no, <laughs> listen, and me and the cardigan. I don't know, but like I, I um, am working on a project with QED, <laughs> so it's it could happen. Ooh. I mean, I mean, I feel like Ooh. I feel like a hoodie is appropriate in the modern era, you know? <laughs> right? Um, but I, I just that because I think we have to grieve of what we're we're losing, but I also think it's very such as artists. Um, um, to envision a better world because a better world is possible and a world that has what we need to live, to love, to survive and thrive and just exist and be happy, that world is still possible. And so um, as we're grieving, as we're crying, as we're being fearful, I do think it's very important to envision the world um, as it should be. And as Natalie says, pick that one thing that you think you can do uh, to make that world possible. Ladies, thank you both so much. Uh, I hope there's some rest and some moments of joy coming for you this weekend. Same to you, Megan. All right, thank you. That's all for today here on City Cast Pittsburgh. Our music is by Benji. Mallory Falk is the executive producer. Sophia Lowe makes the show what it is. Francesca DeBecco writes that Hey Pittsburgh newsletter. And I am your host, Megan Harris. We will be back on Monday with more news from around the city. Have a great weekend, everyone. I like to feed people. I'm Italian. That's what fills my cup. So if you need to be in community, come over. I will cook you dinner. <laughs>